everybody, welcome to another Toy Guys Talking, chatting with Cincy Nerd today of youtube.com slash Cincy Nerd and at Cincy Nerd, wherever you go on social media. Cincy, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, how are you doing? Fantastic. Thanks everyone for listening and have a great night. That was quick. That joke never gets old. <laughs> so we're, we're totally off the cuff here. Um, nothing prepared. Uh, just whatever question pops into my mind. The first thing is, what's sure. your favorite toy line to collect? Oh, geez. That's a tough question. Uh, as I look at the background of your <laughs> your area there, uh, I right now it's Motu. Um, I've been getting back into uh, Motu Classics. Um, my, my taste in what I collect kind of shifts based on whatever I'm feeling at the time, but I kind of stick to main toy lines. I stick to Turtles. I stick to Motu, Joes, and Transformers. Um, and then I occasionally buy some hot toys there, here and there, some Mezco, stuff like that. So, yeah, me but, too. I've always been a weaver. Like, yeah, Joe has a special place in my heart, Transformers too. But there are times where like, even if pizza is your favorite meal, you can't eat it every day. And, exactly. Yeah. And I try all the time because it's half price Monday here <laughs> in my area. And so sometimes you have to eat it every day, leftovers, but uh, it's just so awesome to you know, just be able to take a break from the thing that you're really passionate about and kind of go to the second string uh, toy line and enjoy that for a while. Exactly. And I collected so many things as a kid. I collected so many toy lines. So it's nice to be able to go from one thing to another and re-engage my interest. If I start getting tired of buying Motus or if I run out of Motus to buy, I'll switch over to maybe some Masterpiece Transformers or maybe some vintage GoBots or something like that. Just whatever I'm kind of feeling at the time, whatever I'm finding, that's the main thing is what am I finding in stores? Am I finding it, uh, you know, at the stores where I'm located in Dallas or if I'm on the road like I am right now, I'm in a hotel room right now in Columbus, Ohio. If I'm hitting some stores up here, maybe some toy shows, I'm finding something up here, maybe that'll, you know, spark my interest in a line that I had forgotten about and start getting back into those like mask. Mask is yes. one of my favorites. Biggest favorites from uh, the 80s. So. Did you know that Mask is the mighty power that can save the day? It, I did know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love Mask, yeah. Um, but, but that's a great way to live. I mean, not just with toy collecting, just at life in general. And, and I think when you figure out some of these uh, universal truths, if you want to call them, they work with everything. They work with your breakfast. They work with your workouts. They work with your job, with dealing with family, friends. Mm -hmm. Tra tragedy whatever they work with toy collecting too. be in the moment feel it and exactly what you said when you were when you were saying that it depends what's you know what situation you're in i was at a mm -hmm. local local toy convention i hadn't thought of starriers in ages oh wow yeah. i had a starrier tommy starrier when i was a kid one of them and i saw one at a toy show and in that moment i was like the biggest starriers fan in the world yeah. especially for the yeah. price like are you kidding me mint on card and it was half of what you would find it on ebay for plus no shipping and yeah. i never would have thought of star years but there it is and i i see other things that i haven't thought of for a while in front of me and and there's no reaction they're like oh that's interesting bionic mm -hmm. six right there's a lot of bionic six fans out there but it doesn't really do anything for me i, I passed it over when i was young and i continue to you know sometimes mm -hmm. i'll grab footage for a, a video or something for other people but yeah, you, you have to just kind of keep your eyes open and keep your heart open. And exactly. sometimes you'll be surprised by what uh, what really makes a connection with you. Absolutely. Yeah, I was at uh, Dallas Fan Days, I think a couple weeks back, and I saw something that I hadn't seen in years, in decades, and it sparked, it brought back a memory and started you know, forming those chemicals in my brain where I'm just like, oh, nostalgia, I need it now. Um, the one that I saw, it's a Shogun Warrior. It was the, the, the really, really tall Shogun Warriors. A guy had four of them, and uh, they were all in box, and he sold all four for 500 total, which was a ridiculous price. <laughs> That's, yeah, not much more than 100 a piece. Yeah. Wow. So, and, but the one that um, I saw was called Dragon, and it brought back this memory all of a sudden that that was the first toy I ever had, like, period, the first toy I ever had, because it was a hand-me-down from my brother, my older brother. He had that toy, and I distinctly remember, I think I was maybe two or three, it might have been one of my earliest memories ever as a human being, yeah. is him giving me the Shogun Warrior, and shooting the, it came with like little circular discs that shot out of its hand, and then I, I think it had an axe 
that you could throw the axe. And I, I remember that distinctly. And me seeing it up there, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I need to have that now. So I've been looking all over eBay to try and get this Dragon Shogun Warrior, the big tall one. Um, I haven't bought it yet, but it's definitely something I'm looking for now. So you've, you've had some exposure to Grandizer then? No, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, I, I, I'm not clear on... With Shogun Warriors, if it's Mazinger, Grandizer, Guy uh -huh. King, like I, I don't know who falls into what category, but one of my earliest memories for cartoons, animation, was, and this was years before, or it felt like it was years before, Transformers. Mm -hmm. And probably uh, maybe a big reason why I love Transformers is because of these, it was called Force 5, uh, mm -hmm. produced by Jim Terry. And they took some anime, Japanese Grendizer with an E, Grendizer, mm. episodes, along with a bunch of other guys, Guy King and stuff, and they dubbed it into English. They chopped it up really badly. It's like mm -hmm. 80 episodes in Japan, 70-something, down to 20-something in uh, in the American run. Uh, mm -hmm. But just watching those giant, you know, very similar to the Sh Shogun Warriors, uh, you know, smashing and bashing each other while you got a guy in the cockpit trying right. to deal with what's going on in the machine so he's like he's trying to fight off the big beasts while uh -huh. he's like wrench you know got a wrench on the ankle it's like oh man this is a bad day at the office that's why uh when pacific rim came out i was like close enough like mm -hmm. this is grandizer or any of those other big uh anime robot type properties yeah, when I saw Pacific Rim, it immediately reminded me of uh, Vehicle Voltron. I'm, I'm I'm one of the few people that likes Vehicle Voltron more than Lion Voltron. I love Lion Voltron, but Vehicle Voltron, I don't know. There was something about it, maybe because it was more, um, I don't know, not realistic, but some of the vehicles were cars. So And I rode around in a car as a kid, so I'm like, oh, this could have been the foot of Voltron. <laughs> more relatable, so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, Plus, yeah. yeah like I, I prefer the Lion Voltron too, but even thinking about it now, like uh, Transformers fans complain about kibble sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, kibble. And I've, I've never really had a problem with car kibble. I don't mind if a bumper is a Transformers chest. In fact, I right. kind of prefer it. But I remember the, the Voltron hands, the lion mouth hands. And that was the one thing that, and the feet. That was the one yeah. thing that I felt like, uh, I wish he had fingers. Yeah, so it's still a lion's head. <laughs> I will give that, uh, you know, advantage to the vehicle Voltron. He, he's more of like a proper looking robot instead of right. a bunch of animals kind of tied together. Mm -hmm. um, and what other toy lines did you grow up? You know, I want to ask what era did you grow up in? You don't have to reveal your age or what year, but um, like what what was big when you were growing up? Well, I'm I will because I'm terrible. Answer. I'm terrible at guessing ages. I mean, you could be you could say 20, you could say 50. I'd be like, OK. I don't know. <laughs> I was born in 75. Oh, okay. So yeah, my, so, my era. Yeah. Um, so um, the toy lines that I collected, uh, I distinctly remember G.I. Joe. I started on Star Wars. I mean, because obviously I, was, I went to the original Star Wars. I don't remember much of seeing it in the theater. What I do remember is going to Empire Strikes Back when I was five years old, seeing it in the theater, and thinking the world has just opened up to me. This is a, a, a brand new world now. It's I'm a live action these... cartoon. Right. And uh, that was just everything to me at the time, Empire Strikes Back. So that's still my favorite movie of all time. I don't think anything will ever top Empire Strikes Back as my favorite movie of all time. But um, So that got me into Star Wars collecting, Star Wars toys. Um, from there, I moved on to G.I. Joe's. Um, from there, I moved on to Transformers. Basically, whatever the kid was bringing onto the bus on the way to school, that was what I was now collecting. Yeah. I remember... Um, I would have Star Wars figures on the bus and we'd, you know, have them in our backpacks and whatnot. And then a kid brought, uh, it was Flint. It, I, it was Flint. And then it, he also brought uh, Snake Eyes uh, because he would go to Pennsylvania. And for some reason, when he went to Pennsylvania, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. And for some reason, whenever he went to Pennsylvania, he always came back with the toys that we had, we had never seen in the D.C. area. So he showed us Flint and Snake Eyes, and I was like, whoa, what are these? Yeah. So I started getting into G.I. Joe's, and that was, I collected G.I. Joe's probably uh, till about 87, and then I moved on to everything else, you know, Transformers, Turtles, He-Man, 
um, and then just beyond. So G.I. Joe continued past the Sunbow run, but I certainly, and I think a lot of Joe fans would agree, felt like even though it continued, I don't think they cared as much any, anymore. The, yeah. the meticulousness, the care and the love that were put into it was put into everything. The file card, the art, the design, the accessories. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. felt like after the Sunbow run, I mean, definitely something stunk in Denmark when the Deke cartoon came out. Definitely yeah. smelled like budget cuts and hey, you guys aren't aren't going all out anymore. Like this is this is not a Duke effort. This is a right. Footloose. Like yeah. who, who's in charge of this unit now? Footloose or Bazooka? <laughs> so there were some great figures that came out post eighty seven, um, but it wasn't the majority anymore. I felt the same with the the vehicles and stuff. But as a as a guy who you know really grew up was introduced to toys with star wars figures mm -hmm. um and then the joes came out which must have been mind-blowing in terms of articulation and detail mm -hmm. um did you ever see anything like a joe before you got the joes like did you get those i've just been recently made aware of some of the 70s mego figures which joes are patterned after mm -hmm. like the black hole figures uh, I did get black hole figures, and I remember getting some Eagle Force figures, the little metallic the right, metal figures. Yeah, I got some of those, and I got some. Was it Sergeant Rock yeah. figures? Uh, I got some of those as well. But the thing that kind of turned me on to GI Joe was the articulation, um, because they had you know more joints and whatnot. I could pose them in more ways. They came with more accessories, more helmets weapons. came off, backpacks came <clears> off. <throat> exactly. But the thing that kind of was the the catalyst for making me want to be interested in G.I. Joe was the fact that my dad was in the Air Force. He was a captain in the Air Force. My brother um, left, he was, he's, my brother's uh, eight years older than me. So when he joined the Air Force himself, I was only nine. So um, the military was something that I was kind of intrigued by. My, my dad and I would take uh, trips to visit my brother in, Illinois at his Air Force Base and we would see the jets and just the relatability again going back to that uh, seeing you know um, Jets helicopters tanks in real life and then seeing them in toy form and then seeing them on comic books and then seeing them in cartoons It was just is everything was right there uh, For me to be interested in so it was just more relatable Joe's is you know that that's that's kind of what turned me into a real toy collector. Um, here and there, I would buy Star Wars figures and whatnot, but once I discovered G.I. Joe's, it was every week I was doing chores around the house to try and earn the two bucks to try and get a new G.I. Joe figure. Yeah. So, but yeah, that, that was the thing is my, my family is a military family, so I just kind of had that connection. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I know there are some people who weren't into G.I. Joe growing up. That's a real, uh, you know, I, I try to, kind of pride myself on being able to see things from all perspectives even you know I, I don't you know if someone's absolute favorite toy of all time is power lords mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a bit of a stretch for me but i'm like okay yeah why, why not i mean yeah yeah, yeah it, it all depends on your exposure and your, your preferences and stuff but how could you not at least be you know interested in gi joe there was something for everybody i mean it right. was so diverse you had your land sea air mm -hmm. you had your villains if that's not your cup of tea hey if you don't like the uniformed organized villains then you got the dreadnoughts like right. there was so much variety in gi joe uh, and it, it was uniform too like all the figures were the same size same scale because you know kids that was one of the things that drove us crazy you know, mm -hmm. stop messing with the scale. Why are masks so small? It would have <laughs> right. been a different story if mask was the same size as uh, Star Wars figures, I think. Definitely, yeah. Uh, to be able to, like, cross uh, pollinate and use Joe vehicles with the mask guys and, and the mask vehicles with the Joe guys. Um, that's still a head scratcher for me. Why so tiny? I don't know. I never understood why they did that. Because when they reintroduced in the 25th line the Matt Tracker figure, I'm like, this is perfect. They could make a Thunderhawk right now, and it would be perfect in scale with the rest of the 25th vehicle. So Yeah, and I understand why. It's because the mask vehicles, unlike the Joe vehicles, which were <clears throat> stationary, they wanted the moving parts and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. that drives the cost up. So, mm -hmm. you know, 
dollars and cents the bean counter as well if it's going to drive the cost up make it smaller that's always been the the answer right look what they did with masterpiece transformers they made that glorious mpo1 mm -hmm. and then i guess they made mpo2 also and then they recolored mpo1 and they went oh he's he's too big yeah downscale them but charge the same oh man right yeah that, that's that, with everything charge the same or charge more make it smaller what have you heard about the new uh, masterpiece optimus prime the anime accurate one I'm not a big fan of it. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is about it. Um, the, the price is. The price is one thing. <laughs> <laughs> the price is ridiculous. But <clears throat> I don't know. I think MP10 is just so. It's so perfect of a figure to me. Yeah. Uh, and the it, other thing it's a sidestep. Like I, I don't think it's better. I don't think it's worse. Really. I mean, the articulation is incredible. So mm -hmm. it's a, wonderful to be able to get him into all those poses. And of course, like having him jump off the screen is great too. And mm -hmm. I'm happy for the people who can afford him. But, you know, it's just for me personally, I'm looking right at MP, whatever he was, the second masterpiece, Optimus. He looks mm -hmm. so awesome. And I'll always pick the the toy accurate or the one that exactly. looks more like a vehicle than the yes. one that looks more like the cell animated simplified look. Uh, exactly. Which is weird. Like the cell animated simplified looks that Takara is doing um they have more articulation it, it's kind of backwards shouldn't they have less articulation if they're m more simplified cell animation looking yeah. so that's the other thing that's like wait a second they should not be as posable as the ones that actually look like vehicles right and i'm with you i'm a more of a fan of the nostalgic feeling of the toy versus the nostalgic feeling of the cartoon because i grew up buying the toys i wanted the toys the toys got me into the cartoon so I want my nicer masterpiece looking figures to look like the toys. Mm -hmm. I suppose the cartoon. S same here. I'll usually go like if there's a metallic paint job over a like a dull looking muted, you know, baby blue or dull mm -hmm. red. I'll usually go for like a little bit of the metallic flake just to get him a little more robotic looking. Mm -hmm. um, so you got the YouTube channel. What what made you start doing YouTube videos? Uh, this actually, <laughs> being, being up here in Columbus. So basically, uh, I used to live in Cincinnati, hence the name Cincy Nerd. Uh, and I would have to go up to Columbus because my, my office is in Columbus. I have a production studio in my office up here. So I'd come up once a week. Uh, and every other week, I'd have to stay at least one or two nights. And I was just bored, to be honest with you. I was bored. Um, I didn't have anything to do. Uh, and uh, I would either go to the movies and go see a movie or I would go out to stores and, and look at toys and look at the toy aisle. Um, toys so, just, so just a, a little point I want to make here. Going to the movies yeah. by yourself, I've done it for a long time since he I love it. does it. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, I've always kind of felt like, isn't it a little sillier to go to a movie with a friend? You exactly. know, Especially if it's like your, your pal, your bud. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've, mm -hmm. I've had some friends who are like, oh, I can't go to the movies by myself. And I would joke around and say, "You need me to hold your hand." Like, <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I, I know it's it's a group thing, right? But I mean, go to a movie. There's a group there. <laughs> you know, right. you might not know them, but they're there. You'll hear them laugh. You'll hear them, you know, react to the movie, and you're part of that little theater community. So exactly. <laughs> I've I've always gone by myself. It's never been an issue for me. I've been going by myself to movies since I was a kid, actually, because I remember on Sunday mornings uh, after my brother joined the Air Force and left, it was my dad, my mom and myself. And we would all go to it was multiplex movie theaters. The big multiplexes were a new thing back in the late 80s, early 90s. And they would go see a movie that they wanted to see my mom and dad. And then I would be like, hey, buy me a ticket for whatever. And I would go see that movie by myself. And so they went to see Lady and the Tramp, and you were going to see Sudden Impact. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's always been a thing. I, the other thing about me is the fact that if I go to a movie with someone, I'm almost more concerned that they're enjoying the movie more than I'm enjoying the movie. Yeah. So I'm always looking over when my wife goes with me in the movie. I'm always looking over to make sure she's paying attention. When my brother goes to the movie, I'm making sure he's not falling asleep. So it's just I just want to make sure that when I'm with people, they're having a good time, and I don't really – concern myself with my me having a good time so that's why it's kind of, it's not really a selfish thing it's just uh it's empathetic I just want to be... or empathic yeah exactly yeah, empathy I just... overload i have the exact same issue 
If okay. I, if I, you know, whether I'm going with my wife or even if I go with a friend or, or alone when, and there's all, there's almost always going to be a guy who's being rude mm-hmm. or, or girl, uh, who's being inconsiderate and it sticks in my craw when I see a person look back 50 times, getting more and more annoyed oh, and they won't speak up. They won't say, Hey, stop being inconsiderate. They'll do that 500 times. They'll, oh, I can't believe then they won't say anything. And I always like in recent years, I've learned to just let it go. It's like you, you've got to rise up. But you know, in my younger days, I'd be like, tap, tap, tap. Excuse me, sir. Don't you see her turning around 50 times? I mean, you're, yeah. you're kicking her seat. You're spilling popcorn on her. Huh? And that, you know, you, you do it enough times and you learn there's no point in saying anything. I mean, right. there's something missing, broken, disconnected, faulty. There's no point. Get up, move, you know, go find a new seat. That's, that's your best exactly. course of action in a movie theater. Yeah. But uh, I'm right there with you. I love going to uh, movies by myself. I actually went to two movies this week by myself. Oh, what did you see? <laughs> I saw uh, Terminator Dark Fate. Ooh. And then I said, yeah. What did you think? <laughs> uh, I, I thought the story was kind of a spit in the face to uh, T2. It kind of made T2 irrelevant for them, you know, without giving away spoilers. But it, it really did. Yeah. Um, I, I've read so- them all. Like I, I love T1 and T2 and I've read them all and mm-hmm. you know, seen some stuff and, yeah. and I, I agree with you. I'm like, they say you either go with it or, or you don't. And, uh-huh. uh, I, that's, that's alien three to me. I mean, that's the closest thing to alien three that I've seen since alien three, yeah. just like, you know, they prided themselves on continuing the last one. We're erasing everything and mm-hmm. we're picking up where the second one left off. And why would you alien three it? Right, exactly. You're, you're, you're almost main character. You're Messiah, some would call him. And they're just like, never mind him. Yep. We got this we new, a new one. Yeah. <laughs> we got a new model. Right. <laughs> like, oof, oof. Linda Hamilton yeah. did a talk show. It was Jimmy Kimmel or something like that. Fallon, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and she's hyping the movie. She's, you know, she's doing what actors do. Mm-hmm. And hyping the movie, but she's so real. She she, she can't help but be genuine, because um, she's not a, a huge Angelina Jolie or Jennifer Aniston type of superstar. She's right. she's had a few uh, successes here and there, but she's very real, genuine, and grounded. And she mm-hmm. sees past all that. And so she does a really great interview, just chatting, being real and and uh, you know pleasant. And mm-hmm. then the guy asks her, "So you've seen the movie? Yeah, I've seen it. What do you think?" It's all right. <laughs> and everyone starts laughing because they're not sure because she's got, kind of got a dry sense of humor. And she she doesn't follow up. She's like, no, I'm kidding. It's fantastic. She's just like, yep. <laughs> all that work. She's like riddled with arthritis now because of like a year of training to get back into shape and gun training. Mm-hmm. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> like I applaud her for her honesty. <laughs> That's kind of my reaction to the movie. It was all right. <laughs> I like the special effects. I like the action and fight scenes, but that's that's about all I liked in it. But yeah, yeah, for wh- how they hyped it, I, I and I haven't seen it. And I probably never will. But mm-hmm. uh, that that's like a giant story thing that I just go, don't alien three it. You know, like it, she should have been the right. star. She should be in eighty percent of that movie. Just like mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I don't think I'll ever stop bringing up Last Jedi. How was that not Luke Skywalker's movie? Starring right. Mark Hamill. How was Force Awakens not Luke Skywalker's movie starring Mark Hamill? Because uh, mm-hmm. they, they go with a youth movement. So I'll always be a firm believer of if you're going to bring back the old name that was made by the old cast, then bring mm-hmm. back the old cast and right. let them star in it. Rocky Balboa. Mm-hmm. Rambo. Rambo. <laughs> Rambo 4. Well, Rambo 5 is a different story, but Rambo 4 is one of my favorite Rambo movies. Rocky mm-hmm. Balboa is my favorite Rocky movie. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with like a, a last ride movie if it's done right, but uh, right. bean counters disagree. You know, they yeah. say the the youth movement. You need a younger character, which I just say change the name. Then you know, come, yeah, exactly. come up with a new name. It Exterminator. Like so- Call it the Exterminator. I don't care because <laughs> people there's... are people are saying like that movie, and I haven't seen it. Maybe you can chime in on this. But some people are saying that would, movie would have been better without Linda Hamilton and Arnold Schwarzenegger shoehorned into it. It definitely would have been better without Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I really did not at all like the way they wrote him into the story. It's it was just outright dumb. 
Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Did you ever I, hear of the Future War books that came out before Terminator 3? No. So <clears throat> before T3 came out, um, mm -hmm. there were, I think, a pair of books called T2. One was Infiltrator and one was Future War. Mm -hmm. And they picked up where Terminator 2 left off. So if this isn't really if none of the Terminator movies for you or anyone listening to, uh, to this aren't working for you and you feel like you're open to the story continuing, cause I'm fine with the story being over like mm -hmm. the, the road T2 road shot end of the story. We're done. Right. But if you feel like, mm, you know, this is kind of like how I feel about the Timothy Zahn trilogy with star Wars. If I ever want to revisit those characters and see mm -hmm. what they did five years down the road, I read the Timothy Zahn trilogy. That's my sequel trilogy. But these Terminator books, uh, a couple years after T2, John's a couple years older. It's kind of like Sarah Connor Chronicles. You know, he's like mm. teen John now, and Sarah's still a little wacky and protecting him. But this was brilliant. And every Terminator sequel that came out, I was like, do this, do, mm -hmm. do Infiltrator. And the idea of someone who's part Terminator, part human is from mm -hmm. Infiltrator also. Because huh. there's a character in there that's not totally Terminator, kind of augmented, like, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's from that book. It's cool that they picked that up. But I was hoping that a Terminator movie somewhere would use Arnold Schwarzenegger as a character named Dieter von Rossbach. <laughs> so Sarah runs into this guy named Dieter von Rossbach and she flips oh. out because it's the T-800. And she, if I'm remembering right, draws the gun on him. She needs to blow him away. He's a Terminator. No, I'm human. I'm human. Oh. What is your problem? Uh huh. He's the human that the T-800 was scanned modeled and after. modeled after. Like, how do you not do that? The guy's in his oh. 60s. Don't make him a Terminator for the sixth time. Right. Make him human. Give him something new to do. He can be charming, <clears throat> charismatic, human, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that he's just a Terminator again out of nowhere, I was like, I don't need to see this. Yeah. What's funny is I, I had never heard of that story until just now. And I didn't know how they were going to kind of shoehorn him into the story. But I knew uh, from watching a review that his name was Carl. Yeah. And I'm like... I wonder, is he human? Or is this the one that's, is he the one that's based on modeled after him? Yeah. So, and I was like, that would be a cool idea. So I was hoping that that was going to be the case in the movie, but it was not. So he was just another guy out of nowhere. And, uh, yeah, that intro scene, um, where he just shows up out of nowhere. I'm like, are you even trying? <laughs> <laughs> they don't even have the bubble. <laughs> like it's not even time track. He just wa waltzes in. Right. Like, ah, oh, man, different, uh, different more. time, different crowd. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, certain things have just passed us by and, and you just, you let it go. You move on. It's like, it's, it's not for us, you know, even though it's marketed as if it's towards us, um, you know, our generation needs to kind of get savvy and, and uh, see the warning signs. Cause we yeah. are, we are targeted for, you know, termination sometimes with these marketing mm -hmm. campaigns and this thing, this whole thing reeked of this is for the old, old original fans. You're mm -hmm. going to love this. I was skeptical right from the start. I was like, yeah. no, I'm not too sure about this. Burn yeah. me with Force Awakens. So, uh, you know, fool me twice. Shame on me. Right. What, what, it just what? seems It seems like Hollywood is just uh, lacking original ideas. So they have to keep going back to successful ideas from years ago and, and try and tap on those. But I just wish there was more original stuff out there. Instead of these rehashes and reboots. That's the great stuff about, uh, the great thing about the stuff we grew up on. It was a new name, but it was mm -hmm. everything that was familiar repurposed and put back together. Like mm -hmm. everyone knows Star Wars drew inspiration from Hidden Fortress and a whole bunch of other things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's just, there isn't that courage or audacity to make a new thing. Or I guess when mm -hmm. they do, it bombs. And that just discourages yeah studios from doing it again like john carter of mars which is a story that's been around forever mm -hmm. but in terms of live action movie there's nothing really been done with it before no mm -hmm. real big comic or cartoon mainstream anything like that so i was excited about that and i enjoyed that thing mm -hmm. but it tanked so that yeah. just makes him go well we won't do that again and then um 
Tom Cruise has done a couple of really good original sci-fi movies, like Oblivion. Mm-hmm. That was a really nice one, and Tanked, and uh, it's nice that Edge that of Tomorrow was good. Edge of Tomorrow, and they're doing a sequel. I'm I'm happy to hear they're doing a sequel mm-hmm. to that. But I think just by the skin of its teeth, it mm-hmm. got that si- uh, sequel. That was an incredible movie, Serious mm-hmm. Groundhog Day. You know. Oh yeah. Um, I love that movie. That movie, Edge of Tomorrow, would have only been better if it was Bill Murray in the starring role <laughs> instead of Tom Cruise. <laughs> he should have had a cameo in it. That would have been great. Oh, incredible. I just, I've been on a bit of a Bill Murray kick lately mm-hmm. and uh, saw his uh, movie, The Razor's Edge, for the first time, mm-hmm. 1984 movie. Mm. Uh, really good movie. His, his serious, kind of serious, as serious as Bill can get, I guess, mm-hmm. movie. I know he's trying to do some more stuff like that recently with Wes Anderson, Sofia Coppola, mm-hmm. but seeing him like as Peter Venkman, like it's that same year he did Ghostbusters. Oh, wow. But it's a really like enlightened film. And the reason I went to see it is because I saw this documentary about the Bill Murray stories. Mm-hmm. Have you heard about what this guy's no. been doing? Uh huh. He'll show up to like random parties. He'll just walk into a bachelor party or a wedding. He, he walked into someone's, um, engagement photos and just kind of stood there, you know, looking like Bill Murray. Yeah. Um, he showed up to, I, I think like a high school or a, a college dorm and started washing dishes so that the, wow. the girls could go party. <laughs> he shows up to bachelor parties and gives advice, uh, other parties and just like plays drums with the band, just yeah. random. And then he disappears as ran- randomly as he appeared. That's amazing. And <laughs> So watching this documentary, I've, I've always called him the master like of uh-huh. comedy. He's a comedy genius. I didn't realize how like enlightened this guy is. And um, one of the things that they touched on in the documentary is this theme that he's snuck into all his movies. It just doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And so there's the clip from Meatballs. Even if we win, it just doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. He screams it over and over again. And then in Razor's Edge, there he is again. Telling his, uh, the love of his life who, you know, they're in love, they're out of love, horrible stuff happens. And, uh, she just keeps like a broken record, the drama over and over again. And mm-hmm. he, and he, in that movie is, I think a world war one vet and he's seen some really nasty stuff. And then he, hmm. he goes to Tibet to live with monks for a while, the, the search for enlightenment. And at the end of that movie, you know, she wants to repeat the whole love circle thing. Uh, and he just grabs her and he goes, you just don't get it. It just doesn't matter. Huh. And it's weird to keep seeing that. And then I think about some other Bill Murray movies I've seen and that's his whole persona. It just yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. And it's funny because that could be a very depressing thought, but he's kind of turned it in a way that it alleviates the pressure from himself. Instead right. of like, I'm so depressed, nothing matters. He's like, why get worked up about anything? It just doesn't matter. Right. And he's figured out how to just have the time of his life doing these things, these zany things that no other celebrity does. And uh, the documentary talks about how he does it to make people's day or year or life. Because you get these guys who are like, I hung out with Bill Murray for a night. You know, we were just chilling and he probably would never recognize me if he saw me again. But, you know, he made my he made my year. It was amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. I like that people are willing, you know, celebrities and whatnot, people that uh, seem like they don't have time to do stuff like that. There are people that do make time to do stuff like that Mm -hmm. just to make other people feel good. Absolutely. So one of the ways that you make people feel good is making YouTube videos, getting back into that. Yes. Uh, Do you want to talk a little bit about your like, do you have a process or do you just kind of whatever pops in your mind? Um, it's basically whatever pops in my mind. I, I started by doing toy hunting, uh, because when I was up here in Columbus, um, uh, I'd never finished that story. So basically I, right. I was just bored. I would go to movies or I would have nothing to do. So I'd start watching YouTube and I saw that people were actually filming themselves in stores looking for toys. I'm like, well, I do that. I go to stores. Yeah. I look for toys. The other thing was the fact that before I started YouTube, I was collecting but I literally knew no one that also collected. So I had no one at all to talk to about my passion, my hobby. My wife was like, yeah, okay, I understand you do that. I'm not into it, but that's cool. I, you know, I respect the fact that you do it. But 
I had all these friends down in Texas and no one, literally no one collected. So I was like, who do I talk to about this? Who do I share? Hey, I just got this new toy. I just got a, you know, a mask rhino. This is awesome. I love it. I got the short mask version. I have no one to t tell any of this stuff to or talk to about it. So um, that's another reason why I decided to do it. I saw that people were actually making videos on YouTube, uh, doing toy reviews, searching for toys, hunting toys, going to toy shows. I'm like, I do all that. I like making videos. I've been making videos since I was a kid. Um, why not give it a try? So I made a video. Um, at the time, pops were very, very like new. So I was kind of getting sucked into the, the pop phase, the Funko pop phase. So I was buying Funko pops. And the fact that they make so many of those things. Is there a Cincy nerd Funko pop? There's not. No. I, I bet you there is. Every time I go to a convention and I see 5,000 of them, I, I take a scan to see if there's one of me. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they, those things were so popular at the time and they were making, they, they had so many licenses. They were making so many of them. It was constantly new things being found whenever I went to a store. So I could go to an FYE at the mall. I could go to a Target, a Walmart, a Toys R Us. And I knew that I was going to find something I had not seen before. Mm -hmm. um, so I was getting into those and just the nostalgia factor of being able to find uh, these different characters from these different properties that I was familiar with kind of drew me back into um, the vintage stuff. Because I was doing mostly modern stuff at the time when I first started my YouTube channel. I wasn't doing much vintage stuff. But me finding the Funko Pops and then switching over more to the G.I. Joe 25th stuff and me wanting to complete that collection. <clears throat> and then me also wanting to uh, buy a lot of the subscription, the FSS stuff, the con stuff that I missed out on. Uh, and that stuff's really rare, hard to find. Uh, it was more of a hunt for me to try and find that stuff. Me going after that stuff kind of brought back the memories of me collecting the original stuff. So it kind of transitioned again into getting back into vintage. So it's just kind of been an ongoing process of, what am I collecting at the time? What it What is being sparked in my brain as far as what I'm collecting? What memories does it bring back? I want those actual things that I had when I was a kid, not these kind of facsimiles or these reproductions or these new versions. I want the originals now. So it's just been a thing. I, I, I've i tried to not collect everything because that's a huge black hole to want everything and to want to collect everything. So yeah, I've don't listen to, to Kenner, kids. Don't collect yeah. them all. <laughs> collect, collect what you love. Right. Um, and that's what I've tried to follow is collect what you love, collect what inspires you, collect what, you know, brings back those memories. And that's what I've tried to do. So as far as uh, the YouTube, I keep getting uh, sidetracked. As far as the YouTube channel, um, it, should, it started as toy hunting. I, it turned into toy hauls because I couldn't keep up with myself going to all these stores. I was buying more things than I could film and or I had time filming or I had time editing. So now it's kind of turned into uh, I film when I'm at toy shows. I film when I, I'm at conventions, but I'm also showing my hauls. And that's kind of the bulk of my videos now is here's all this stuff that I bought. Let me show you what I bought. And here's how excited I am about it because here's how it makes me feel. So mm -hmm. that, that's so you do have some video product. You have video production experience, cutting, editing, sound editing, and all that. Yes, and um, I, a lot of that I taught myself. Um, basically, just to give you a a brief history on that, uh, I was in sales for twenty years. I would say my twenty years. Like <laughs> exactly, <laughs> uh, and um, it it is a tough uh, profession to be in. Uh, you constantly have to be on. You constantly have to be in a good mood. Uh, you constantly have to be out there, you know. You trying have to, to constantly be disingenuous. This is true as well. Yes, it is. I mean, you have to you have to be happier than you actually are. I think in the long run, that's not healthy. It's not at all. And being disingenuous is not healthy. That's my opinion. Disclaimer. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I was in sales. I was tired of it. I wanted out of it. Um, so I was like what do I do now? So I pitched to my company. I know so much about this product that I'm selling. 
how about if we were to start doing training videos so that rather than us sending people out to these locations, I'm gonna make a video and then we can share that and we'll save money on all these travel expenses. So they're like, that's a good idea. So I actually taught myself video editing um, and that actually happened just before I started the YouTube thing. The YouTube thing was, oh, I'm learning all these things, teaching myself video editing with this new profession that I have. Why don't I use it as a hobby as well? So it, it was just kind of, YouTube was an extension of what I was teaching myself and learning. I was going to different workshops and whatnot, uh, but I essentially taught myself how to be a video professional. I love it when people have the audacity to do that, mm -hmm. to not go the, the beaten path, the most usually traveled route, the safe route, mm -hmm. or, or the expensive route of, you. well, you have to go to school. Well, you have to be instructed by someone who knows what they're doing. I think the stuff that you learn the best is when you throw yourself into the fire and you exactly. just, you, you learn, you know, every job that I've ever done, you can sit there and do the theory and, you mm -hmm. know, the practice and the, the paperwork, but until you get thrown into the fire and you, you actually start doing it, that's, that's the best way to learn. So I, I love when I hear people say that, and, and that's mostly how I learned as well. I mm -hmm. went to to film I study I majored in film studies at the University of Waterloo here in southern mm -hmm. Ontario and that mm -hmm. was mostly theory which was very very good I think that trained me to look very closely at the story because if you mm -hmm. don't have a good story or let me say instead of story point moral mm -hmm. it really focused on what is the essence of of the message you're trying to convey so I went through this program and there was very little actual practical filmmaking there was a class or two. Mm -hmm. That was the type of thing that you figure that out on your own. It's it's not rocket science. And I wish I could remember who it was. It was a, a, a pretty well-known, well-respected filmmaker who said, everything you need to know you can learn in a weekend with a camera and some lights. And huh. obviously there was a huge backlash, like, what are you, crazy? Or shh. <laughs> but when I heard that, I was like, it's not too far off the mark there. Right, exactly. You know, it's not... It's not it looks like it's rocket science. It's really not. You got to have the passion. You have to have the work ethic. Uh, you have to be willing to fail 99 times to succeed mm -hmm. that 100th. You have to have tenacity. So it's it's not easy. But it's true. And once you learn the tricks of the trade, then you can just keep using those tricks. You can hone and polish them mm -hmm. a little bit. But, but my particular program, I really appreciated that it, it focused on what's the point and I'll, i won't I'll never forget my instructor you know talking about what is the motivation <laughs> and everyone's like this is so foreign and bizarre like what do you mean motivation it made us all really uh dissect and think about mm -hmm. why is it that you love what you love mm -hmm. and in, you know in retrospect it made me think mm -hmm. about a lot of the 80s cartoons and comics, movies that I loved. Like, what mm -hmm. is it about He-Man that I love? Now, without giving it much thought, I would have said, cool toys, man. You know, you, they got the spring waist. That's mm -hmm. not what it was about. It was about He-Man's, you know, his spirit, his mm -hmm. undying optimism. Same with Optimus Prime. Same with the Joes, the camaraderie of the Joes. When you really delve beneath the surface... I started to learn that's why I love that stuff. And also that's why Centurions are cool toys, dude. But as far <laughs> as the show, I, I can't quote a line from Centurions other than Power right. Extreme. Because what was your motivation? Their motivation was to sell toys. Yeah, Silverhawks, for the lar of most part, same deal, right? Visionaries was to sell toys. There's a definite difference for 80s toys. You know, there was the toy commercial shows and then mm -hmm. there was the shows written by brilliant writers who mm -hmm. were like hey man i get to write and i don't care if it's a toy i'm gonna yeah. write a pulitzer prize you know level worthy great story even if it is about a talking horse mm -hmm. it's true so what are some of your uh, favorite tunes from the 80s um let's see gi joe thundercats uh, Transformers, <clears throat> Mask. You and like the Mask cartoon? Yeah. Some See, yeah, I'd, I'd kind of group that in with the Centurions. Like, you're totally right. Yeah, I it's mean, still it, enjoyable, it and that theme song can't be beat. It is the best. Exactly. It's my favorite '80s cartoon theme song. But, yeah. but the episodes are, 
what's your motivation they're they're commercials basically yeah (laughs) but um as a kid i really appreciated them because i had all my toys out when it came on and i would mimic what was going on on the screen with my toys at the time so cool um yeah um i liked uh you know a lot of the some of the more obscure ones uh that they didn't even do a whole lot of toys for like the dungeons and dragons cartoon i loved that cartoon um Cartoons like Inspector Gadget, I was a big fan of that. Yeah. They didn't do many toys for that. Um, but, you know, the main ones, all the ones that I am still fond of, the toy line and collecting, Turtles, He-Man, those are all my favorite cartoons at the time. So, Have you heard about Kevin Smith doing the new animated He-Man Netflix series? I am. Uh, yeah, I was at uh, PowerCon. He was there when they announced that. And I'm looking forward to it, but at the same time, I'm apprehensive. Anything that's new with He-Man, I'm apprehensive about. I just don't yeah. want them to ruin what's already out there because what's already out there is so great, and I don't want him to. I don't want them to deviate too much. He's he's already said, you know, it's going to be the He-Man. You know, it's a continuation. Yeah. But I just hope that's the case. That's not a selling point for me anymore. Yeah. Saying we're picking up where the old one left off. Ten mm-hmm. years ago, I'd be salivating. Today, I'm like, ooh, thanks for the warning. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can count on one hand picking up where the old one left off, and I loved it. Like yeah. Tron Legacy. Um, there's got to be a couple more. <laughs> but, <laughs> <Tron> Legacy. <laughs> but for the most part, picking up where the old one left off, it just... I don't know, like Kevin Smith, I like his stuff, but I used an analogy recently. Um, I love Kevin Smith's writing. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to make me a great pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing about his work hid- hints that he makes a great pizza. Yeah. Just because he's a great writer. And, uh, you know, that, you know, to say that you're going to continue Lou Scheimer's style of writing, I don't know anybody who has the heart to continue Lou Scheimer's writing, maybe Erica Scheimer. I don't right. know. Maybe she sat under Lou's learning tree enough that she could really, you know, that guy was, was something else. Like he wasn't a rare breed. He was a one of a kind. Mm-hmm. Um, he constantly, the stories I've heard of him constantly took the moral high ground rather than the profitable route and mm-hmm. just said, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. No, I'm not, I'm not having it. Um, and he made, uh, you know, He-Man is a really good, morally wholesome cartoon, but Brave Star was just another level mm-hmm. of like, I'm always recommending adults, especially, you know, if, if they got kids, like let your kids watch Brave Star. But I think it's good for the adults too, to just hear the even keel, quiet, peaceful Marshall mm-hmm. tell everybody how it's got to be, whether you like it or you don't, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. He's just such a peaceful, serene character. And then there's thirty thirty in there if, you know. You want the rambunctiousness, which yeah. everyone just loves him romping and stomping and Brave Star trying to keep <laughs> keep him under wraps. I didn't watch much Brave Star as a kid, but um, just seeing it now as an adult, it does make me want to go back and like, I don't know, have they done a DVD collection for it? Yeah, they've put out uh, a best of, so five best episodes or something like that, which includes the movie. Oh, wow. And uh, and then part one of the entire series and then part two of the entire series. And it's a beautiful set. If you can get the original one that is like, you know, DVD sets used to be, they all fold out and out mm-hmm. and they keep folding mm-hmm. out. And you just have art as far as the eye can see. But um, I was a big fan of Brave Star in the uh, 80s when it first came out. And I had never seen the movie because mm-hmm. it just it didn't hit theaters here. And I never saw it on TV. I didn't see a chopped up version of it on TV. It just, you know, it just started. And I loved it that way. So I got this DVD set before they put out the full set. They put out the best of. And I start watching this, The Legend. It's called The Legend. I start watching it. I'm like, now, you know, my memory's kind of foggy with a lot of these cartoons. But I don't remember an origin story. Like, (laughs) he's a kid and he's meeting 30, 30. Like, I would have... 3030 was my favorite character on that show. I would have remembered how they met. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a two-hour masterpiece or or 90 minutes, something like that. Total origin story, how he came to New Texas and how Tex Hex became a villain and got his powers. And I finish watching it and I go, how often do you get to love something? You grow up on it and you love it. 
and 20, 25 years later, you get to see the origin story, the prequel, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and it's actually perfect. Yeah. It's it's the voice actors that you remember. You know, they're not a little older. The writing hasn't taken a step down. The censors haven't been a little more lax. Like it's because it existed, right? It, it was right. like a lost treasure for me. That's the type of prequel that I love. Mm-hmm. You know, like, oh my God, I can't believe this thing exists. This is my dream Brave Star prequel. Mm-hmm. So I would highly, highly recommend. And it's, you know, it, you don't even need the DVD sets now. It's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's on Tubi, but there's so many online streaming services where you can see all those old cartoons. Hmm. You had made a comment about the art when you opened up the folding set and all the artwork. And I actually just started a new collection. Uh, when I was at PowerCon, I found a vendor that was selling original animation cells, uh, Lou Scheimer oh, animation man. cells. So I actually bought my first four um, Masters of the Universe animation cells. But... The guy had a ton of Brave Star animation cells too, yep. but I did I didn't have that connection to Brave Star uh, like I did with Motube, so I didn't buy any of the Brave Star animation cells. But I could see myself if I watch it and I start getting into it again, I could see myself, you know, getting more of those cells because I, I there's something about those. It's like you have a, a physical, actual piece of the cartoon that you loved as a kid. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's and, a piece of the show. Release. Yeah, and there may be thousands of them but it's special because an actual artist nothing against digital artists but Mm -hmm. like the amount of effort that went time and effort that went into it painting each cell and then they got reused over and over again Mm because that was filmation's whole thing like reuse it you know (laughs) we don't we don't need to animate a new sequence reuse it so those popped up on ebay a few years ago and because brave star doesn't have the huge following that motu has they went for next to nothing. Like oh, they wow. were going for a few bucks for amazing, like the, not just a cell of Brave Star, but the beautiful sprawling backgrounds. Yes. Mm-hmm. With the pink sky and Star Peak. And they used to, a little Brave Star with 30 30 on a clear transparency so you could ride them across. So mm-hmm. I got a couple of those. And uh, I still have to pinch myself sometime because I, I can't believe I own it. And I can't believe um, what it cost me because uh, it wasn't much. Because, again, mm-hmm. it was like no one knows these are on eBay. No one knows how special these are. Mm-hmm. In the intro, when 3030 transforms from horse into mm-hmm. like biped, mm-hmm. I have that whole ridiculously long sequence. Of from the horse. introduction? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. And, and I can only assume that. They used it for the episodes, you know, over and over again. So I, I, I'm assuming there's more than one, but maybe there isn't, or maybe there's very, very few of them. But it's him and horse, up, up, up a little more, up, doing that, uh-huh. you know. And it, it's a, it's a whole bunch of them until he's like standing. That's amazing. It's a giant stack of them, and I just mm-hmm. I was like, thirty thirty transforming. This is if not one of a kind, like four of a kind or something like that just an incredible thing to own well that's what the way i think of it is each cell is one of a kind it's one of one so i'm the only person that owns this specific image where they're they're in that specific pose so that's why i'm kind of into them right now it's a really nice thing especially when you're a toy collector when you own one of a hundred thousand or you know i don't know fifty thousand i don't know how many like let's take a wild guess how many grunts from G.I. Joe, do you think they made? Oh, geez. You Tons. Know? So we, you know, so many of us had a grunt, but to have that one cell, it's like, you're the only one that has that. And right. millions of eyes saw that moment in the cartoon, mm-hmm. right? Like, especially if it's a sequence of like She-Ra's uh, Swift Wind taking off or, or He-Man, like whoever has uh, By the Power of Grayskull, oh, wow. that sequence, Adam transform because they use that at, million times right that was in every episode yeah. so that that would be another really special one to have you know definitely um before we wrap up here because we're, we're coming up on an hour i wanted to ask you about some of your youtube videos what what are some of the like most ambitious videos you've done like something with some of that like real uh production quality sound or or lighting stuff like that have you ever gone really in in depth and trying um, to make like you know really something more than just uh you know kind of a selfie video 
Not really. That's the thing is I, I kind of feel like I'm a little lazy <laughs> when I do my YouTube stuff because it's a hobby. And by the time I'm actually starting to work on editing a YouTube video, I've already worked on an actual video for work for like eight hours. It's tough. So, yeah. yeah so, and and I've put, I put a lot of editing into my work videos. So I haven't really done a whole lot of things. One of the things that I was kind of just happy with is uh, I started doing like little skit videos where I'm kind of acting uh, as the introduction of some of my more recent videos. And I, I like acting and I like, um, you know, portraying a character. So uh, I did one where I had missed a chase pop and I just liked filming that. I, I thought it was a lot of fun to film, a lot of fun to edit and stuff like that. I mean, that wasn't really uh, overly ambitious, but it's just more fun. Um, I, I like to incorporate as much fun, humor, character as I can in the YouTube videos um, because, you know, I, I don't know. I would bore myself if I just did a straight, hey, here's what I bought. It's great. Hey, here's another thing I bought. I like to infuse it with as much personality as I can because I, I like to think that I'm a pretty humorous person. I like to make people laugh, so I try to share that as much as I can in my videos. Um, I do... So one of the things that I do for my job is I actually film a short film uh, every year and we show the short film at our holiday party. And that's why I'm actually up here this entire week is I'm filming a short film for the entire week. And it's kind of a challenge for me because by the time I land here on a uh, Sunday night, Monday morning, I'm filming. So I have to, all, all my prep work up until then, I have to write a script, I share it with some of my coworkers and make sure that they think it's funny because it's all humorous. Uh, I have to assign parts. I have to figure out which of my coworkers that can't act would be best portrayed in this role. Uh, and I have to kind of write it in their personality so that I know that they can actually pull it off. I have to make a production schedule. It's a whole thing. Uh, so by the time I'm here, it's kind of a challenge for me to film in a week's time, go back home, and then edit the whole thing for the next two weeks. Yeah. So, And editing, really, it takes the starch out of you. It really, it really is. Does. It's like surgery. I mean, if you're precise, um, I, I've always cut by feel. Um, mm -hmm. And to do that, you really it's almost like you've got these imaginary tentacles coming out of you and plugging into the into the thing that you're working on. And it it's draining. You know, it can be very mm -hmm. tiring because you're you're very attentive. You're watching, you're feeling and The cut has to go there and mm -hmm. you can't teach it. And there, there can be people you're trying to train and teach. How do I edit? And and you can try. And mm -hmm. that's where you cut. And you try to explain to them, do you understand why? And they're like, I don't know why you cut there. I'm like, how do you not feel it? <laughs> you can't go a quarter of a second longer. It's too long. Yeah. <laughs> and they just don't get it. They're like, who cares? That's why sometimes when I see videos that are very unpolished and like... You probably uh, appreciate this too, like when you see us two seconds of just dead air, oh, I and you're like, it. "How do you yeah. not cut that?" <laughs> because it's those you're wired into it, and you're like, "Cut!" <laughs> yes, yeah. Whenever uh, someone asks, "Hey, uh, I'm looking for some advice. I want to start my own YouTube channel. What would you recommend?" One of the first things I always say is, "Avoid dead air." Yeah. And they're like, "What do you mean?" I'm like where there's no sound whatsoever, there's no talking, you're not talking to the camera, you're not explaining anything, there's nothing going on, cut it out because it's boring. You just wanna get rid of that and get the video going. Mm -hmm. It's all about pacing. So yeah, that's one of the recommendations I always give to people. Hey, I wanna start a YouTube channel, what, what should I do? Be yourself, yep. be the most charismatic, energetic version of yourself when you're on camera and cut out dead air. <laughs> or if you're, and that's great advice, but, or if you're very chill, because mm -hmm. I, I think I, when I started doing my videos, I was doing an impression uh, of like, hey, everybody. Yeah. Um, and that didn't last long because it's just not me. And yeah. I started to do me, you know, I just, mm -hmm. I started to be more real and genuine. And there's going to be a few flies in the ointment who go, Oh, it's so boring, but that's part of the whole YouTube gig. It's mm -hmm. daily training of how to dismiss, ignore, and genuinely not care what people mm -hmm. of no value to you think. And then you start getting the people who are like-minded and they appreciate that. And they go, you know what? Mm -hmm. I just like that you're, uh, you know, you're like, uh, the opposite. 
of all mm-hmm. of these jazz hands, disingenuous, you know, hey guys, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. You know, obviously not singling anyone out, but you know, and and you know, definitely not anyone in the toy community. There's going to be people who would be like, he's talking about so and so. Now I'm thinking of more so like the enter, you know, movie guys or the the entertainment dudes who mm-hmm. have like you know five million viewers. You know, again, yeah. I'm yeah. sure people can think of like a five million subscriber channel. I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus here, but that's the type I uh, stuff I see, and I go, that's not you. You know, mm-hmm. that's. That's you to the millionth power, and mm-hmm. like we said earlier, I don't think that's healthy in the long run. Just right. not not being genuine, because they see you at the grocery store and they're expecting that song song and dance, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, it's you, and the, the guy's like, "I'm just here to buy cereal. Please leave me alone." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but uh, one thing I really appreciate about your videos is that they are fun. They're a positive. So I, I like that you are enjoying what you're doing. You're having a great time. Uh, you try to uh, inject a little bit of humor. And yeah, if there's people out there who uh, want to try their hand at it, um, you got to love it. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just an absolute necessity and you you won't be able to fake it. You got to love it. You have to be passionate about it or anything you do in your life. Uh, and you also have to be ready for that one person in 100 maybe maybe Mm -hmm. maybe it's one in 10 but that one in 100 who just isn't going to dig what you do and you you have to keep going in spite of them you Mm -hmm. have to you have to take that and instead of getting boo-boo face and saying oh i made one person unhappy you have to almost be kind of proud about it and go ah there you are (laughs) you're that one you're that one guy and it's again it's all healthy man it it just translates in into everything in your life uh that that one little thing that doesn't quite go the way you want it to that's just training for the rest of your life where you're i don't know something goes wrong with your car and instead of no why me you're like well yeah it was about time Mm -hmm. i've had a smooth ride and it's about time uh the axle went out or or whatever you know i gotta get the engine serviced or change a wheel or something right there's always going to be little things but uh, I, th- I think like you can't, you can't be all or nothing. You can't just let that one little thing erase all of the, the good stuff that comes with it. Exactly. I love the fact about your channel. I, and I, I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but you're obviously one of my favorite YouTubers out there. Your channel is amazing. And you're and- careful. You're going to embarrass me. <laughs> no, your GI Joe videos are, are a large reason why I've gotten so much back into vintage Joe's. Um, your videos where you highlight the releases for each year are the reason why I display my 25th Joe's the way I do. I display them by year release. I originally had them just kind of all together, but I was like, he's, he's showing each year which Joe's came out, which vehicles came out, and because of that, and my detolfs, I've displayed my Joes that way. So all the 82s, all the 83s, 84s, 85s, 86s, all together because of your videos. So I just wanted to share that with you, that they are amazing videos. They Thank always, when I'm, when I'm having a bad day, if I had a bad day, if I watch one of your videos, it always brings me up. So I just wanted to share that. I, I don't think you hear it enough. So I appreciate that. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Um, ladies, sorry about all the guys out there who are <laughs> blowing through the budget <laughs> buying all these toys. I, I keep hearing you. You're the reason I got into GI Joe again. <laughs> like, uh, no, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> that, I think that's the new Canadian thing. Sorry. I'm not sorry. But um, like the year uh, sequence, it was something I never really thought about either until I started to look at those catalogs again. Mm-hmm. And it sparked something in me. And the excitement every year of... Oh, we're getting more GI Joes. Who's gung ho? Who's Doc? Mm-hmm. And then more GI Joes. Who's this Rakondo and Blowtorch? So, for me, it was very sequential. And then mm-hmm. it works for every single toy line, He Man too, and especially you know Transformers for sure. There's the '84. There's the '85, which is like '84, just you know, little tweaked. And then '86 was like, this is totally different game. We're 20 years into the future. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's cool when I hear other people 
have that feeling too and that stirs that up in them as well you know like oh it you know the year was important it's it's almost like um wine <clears throat> connoisseurs you know mm -hmm. i love hearing the toy uh toy collectors vintage toy collectors are like wine connoisseurs ah 86 mm -hmm. that was a good year yeah. general hawk sergeant slaughter rodimus prime <laughs> Yeah. Well, Good. it's funny because I, I distinctly remember I got most of my vehicles on birthdays and Christmases. I would get figures, you know, throughout the year, but my, my mom never bought me a vehicle unless it was my birthday or Christmas. So I was, I always remembered getting my favorite presents ever for Christmas were the Mobat and the Rattler. And I was, I was remembering what year was that? And then I was watching your videos. I'm like, Oh yeah, that was that year. So your videos helped kind of helped me remember chronologically my favorite times of my life <laughs> with my Christmases. So yeah, I just want to thank you for that as well is, is you've helped me jog my memory because into my forties, I'm forgetting a lot of stuff. My memory is not what it used to be. So I need, isn't it great? Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what? And, yeah. Who are, are you? you talking about? <laughs> who, who the heck are you? <laughs> <laughs> I need as many reminders as I can to help me jog my memory. So Plus, I got a lot of concussions when I was uh, younger. I played ice hockey, so oh. I hit my head a lot. Yeah. So I, I was supposed to. I'm Canadian, but I it was never my it was never my thing. I was more of a checkers guy. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's been so much fun. Uh, Absolutely, we can we can keep chatting for a little bit for the for the Patreon tribe if you want. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but we're gonna sign off right now. Uh, give you a couple of plugs. YouTube.com/slash CincyNerd is where your YouTube channel is. Yep. You're on Instagram as well. You're on Twitter. Are mm -hmm. you on Facebook? I am on Facebook. Cincy Nerd or Facebook.com slash Cincy Nerd. Check Cincy Nerd out on all of those things. It's been really fun talking with you. We're going to keep talking here. And uh, thanks everyone out there for listening in podcast land, watching on YouTube land uh, to join the tribe. Hit sub subscribe and all that uh, that jazz, the spiel that I do. <laughs> and nerd must stay. Nerd must stay. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Nerd must stay. Nerd must stay.